I guess we will start. So welcome everybody to this uh, SIG Computational Biology Seminar Series. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Christian Ahrens from the Agroscope. So Christian studied the technical biology at the University of uh, Stuttgart in Germany. And he earned his PhD, he earned his PhD in genetics from the Oregon State University in the US in 95, working on the identification of essential stimulatory genes involved in baculovirus DNA replication. Um, then from 95 to 97, he went on to his postdoc work um, at the Oregon State University and then at the Institute for Genetic uh, Research Center in Karlsruhe in, in Germany. Uh, Christian then worked on uh, target discovery and bioinformatics research for several companies in Germany and in uh, Denmark from 1999 to 2004. And then he moved to Switzerland uh, at the University of Zurich and at the ETH, where he worked as a scientist in proteomics bioinformatics. And since 2013, he's um, based at the Agroscope, leading the molecular diagnostics and genomics uh, and bioinformatics group. And since 2014, he's also a group leader at the SIP Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So Christian's uh, research group uh, centers around the bioinformatic integration and analysis of data sets from state-of-the-art omics technologies. Uh, the data, the data sets uh, they're working on are, um, comes from uh, close collaboration from, uh, with the experimental biologists. And those data sets include uh, genome sequence, gene and protein expression, as well as metabolic, uh, metabolomics data. And one particular focus of the group is to uh, exploit the strategies to achieve complete genome uh, coverage, including the membrane proteome as well as to identify all the proteins uh, encoding in a genome, uh, which is called proteogenomics. So the group contributed also um, to the development of uh, several uh, softwares. One of them is called Proter, which is a software tool that allows the visualization uh, of the topology of the membrane proteins and to integrate annotation and experimental evidences in a form of publication ready plots. And uh, another one, uh, another resource is called Peptid Rank which allows the user to select the best uh, suited uh, peptides to quantitatively measure protein amounts in several uh, organisms. So today, Christian will share with us some insight on protein discovery in prokaryotes based on uh, an integrative analysis of genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics data. So Christian, thanks for coming, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I will try to give a bit of an uh, overview of the activities of the group in the next 45 minutes or so. Right now I'm employed by Agroscope, a federal research institute for agriculture and nutrition. The work that I'm going to be talking about mainly uh, has been done at the University of Zurich as part of a systems biology priority project. And let's um, go right in. Not yet. Yeah, now it's working. So, yeah, thank you. Basically, just here from the SIP, you see kind of some of the activities of the group with the main activity in proteins and proteome. I will also cover some of our efforts uh, integrating gene information, genome and transcriptome information into that, and cover some a bit of what we do in terms of um, infrastructure, mm -hmm. and all this is sort of related to systems biology here, a uh, recent picture for those attending uh, offline. So give you an outline of the talk, I will briefly try to remind you of the advantages of proteomics data, why does this actually gives us a lot of unique insights, then uh, tell you about a generic strategy to cover complete express proteomes, we'll do that on prokaryotes where this is feasible. Um, give you some follow, uh, insights on the follow-up studies we've done exploiting this rather unique data set, a complete expressed condition-specific express proteome. And then for the remainder, last 15 minutes or so, show you what we're working on right now, proteogenomics, that is using the proteomics data to try to find evidence for all the genes encoded in the genomes. And as I will show you, currently, I believe, all of the genome annotations, even of the best annotated model organisms, including E. coli, are still a draft genome annotation, known as complete. 
and then I'll finish with summary and outlook. So in an era where basically we can sequence prokaryotic genomes or even lower complexity eukaryotic genomes at ease within days, I still think it's important to remind ourselves that actually there are some major advantages that proteomics data provide that you cannot get from gene expression or genomic data. One of them is that if we look at the correlation of the average mRNA concentration and protein concentration in the cell, typically there's an okay correlation, something to our square value of 0 0.5, clearly indicating you know, the gene expression where you can measure all the elements of the genome, all the genes, does not give you the information about the true expression level of the proteins, which are much closer to function in the cell. Moreover, of course, proteins can be modified by different post-translational modifications, including, for example, phosphorylation. So all signaling cascades and so forth will not be able to deduce their activity by using gene expression, but you would need uh, proteomics information for that. So protein modification or also maturation as for example for the uh, proteases is going to be information only provided by proteomics. Furthermore, uh, often you would want to get insights about the function of a protein and, or a gene and often that's done by guild of association by looking at its interaction partners. Proteins don't work alone, they work in complexes, so this information of which protein works together with another protein is going to be very important to help you decipher the function of certain processes in the cell. A fourth advantage is called proteogenomics. We'll cover that in more detail later. Well, basically, you use the mass spectrometry data, the tandem mass spectrometry, the peptides that you analyze in the mass spectrometer, and you match these spectra against a database, which can be a protein database, could be also a six-frame translated genome, or any other ab initio gene models to kind of provide evidence for expression of these gene models, new evidence that has not been contained, for example, uh, additional exons, more exons that have not been annotated, and even completely new gene models. The last advantage I'd like to mention is, of course, that protein expression also. If you do take your data from the uh, respective subcellular localization, that you can get this information, and that provides you with a lot of insight into where is a certain protein active, which can be of functional relevance as well. Now, in a review that we published a while ago, a couple of years ago, we basically looked at how proteomics and proteome coverage had uh, developed over the last 10 years or 10 or 15 years. And what is important to note is that a lot of developments in terms of experimental approaches, instrumentation, better mass spectrometers, software, computational approaches have really helped to propel the proteomics field. One way to look at that is, for example, to look at the proteome coverage here from 0 to 100 percent and then the year. And we're looking at an example, yeast legacies as service, where by two degel studies in 99, 1999, going over really a long period of time, years of experimentation, so about 6 percent of the proteome were covered. In 2001, there was a publication where 23 percent of the theoretical yeast proteome were covered by shotgun proteomics, basically this gel-free method that didn't rely on 2D gels anymore, but took the proteins, digested them in peptides, separated them on chromatography columns, and measured them by mass spectrometry. So the shotgun proteomics provided a big boost. And actually, in 2006, the coverage achieved by one experiment alone was 31 percent, achieved by Matthias Mann group. And in 2008, they, using extensive fractionation, really massive effort, were able to define what they call the first completely expressed proteome yeast under two conditions. At the University of Zurich, we had measured proteome catalogs for different uh, model organisms, including Drosophila, Arabidopsis, and C. elegans, but had not come to this complete proteome coverage. One of the things that we wanted to achieve in this initiative at the university was basically to learn and take some of the uh, very useful strategies in genomics. And there was a two-step strategy in genomics that has been very useful, where in the first discovery phase, you go in and identify all the elements of the uh, system. And in terms of the genome, that's the genome sequence. So that, as you can remember, for the human genome, that took years to accomplish. But once you have this initial step, this discovery phase finished, you can actually, and 
that's what people have done to develop technology and set specific probes to then use microarrays with specific oligonucleotide probes to now go in and score the system for the quantitative expression of all the elements. We wanted to develop something similar with the proteome going in in the discovery phase, basically go and measure from many different tissues, time points, developmental stages, a proteome as comprehensively as possible, and then to use an analogy to these specific oligonucleotides that you're aware of for microarrays to use specific signature peptides, so-called prototypic peptides that would uniquely and ambiguously identify one protein, and then use a different mass spectrometry technology that doesn't look at all the proteins, but only the peptides that you tell the mass spectrometer to look at, which is about 100-fold more sensitive, and can generate you these complete quantitative data series <coughs> required for systems biology. One important point with this analogy breaks is that with the genome sequencing, except for the maybe like uh, varying percentage of repeats that are very difficult to sequence, you can parallelize this. This is really a process that can be parallelized, sped, sped up. But if you look at trying to discover a complete transcriptome or proteome, you have a lot of transcripts or proteins of varying abundances. So you will typically always hit the most abundant ones. And if you want to describe a complete transcriptome or proteome, you really need a different strategy. And this is also reflected by the fa fact that we have maybe something like even more than 30,000 complete genome sequences. As I mentioned before today, prokaryotes, you can sequence some of the low complex ones in a day, less than a day. Complete proteomes at that time, there was one in yeast. So, I'm switching gears now and introducing the model system that we used, prokaryote, Bartonella Hensele. This was in a collaboration with Professor Dea from Biosyn and Basel. And basically, the model is most interesting to us because it had a relatively small genome, about two megabase pairs with about 1,500 protein coding genes. It was a model organism or is a model organism to study host pathogen interaction and importantly can be grown in pure culture. So we could isolate pure bacteria, which is important when we try to go for a complete proteome. We did have an in vitro model system available and the group also had uh, technologies to do subcellular fractionation. This in vitro model system is based on, this is the life cycle of uh, Bartonella, which here you see the phase in the uh, intestinal and in the mid gut of the uh, uh, arthropod vector, where it's then deposited on the skin, gets into the dermis, and then basically comes into endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, where it's basically the, the primary, the first reservoir where replication takes place, and then later on it goes into uh, a replicative cycle within erythrocytes. And in this, uh, uh, basically, in this endothelial cells, we knew that certain set of genes was re required, a surface protein, a verb ET4, type 4 secretion system. And there's actually two of these secretion systems, one of them, this verb ET4, that's required, absolutely required for the infection of these endothelial cells. And this is the model system we were trying to replicate. Whereas if in the um, negative control, there's this other type 4 uh, uh, receptor, the TRW, type 4 secretion system, that would be required for infection of the erythrocytes, which we did not expect to see expressed under all conditions. Importantly, of the many advantages I told you, if you want to now really go and do such a complete proteome study, you have to really focus. And we did focus on the express proteome. You cannot cover all these advantages. And we developed a strategy where we tried to basically, a generic strategy, how we could achieve to get these condition-specific express proteomes that envisioned to select and isolate from matched samples, both total RNA, sequence them, um, to saturation, find the mouse here, sequence that to saturation to kind of define an endpoint estimate, go in from the same samples, extract the proteins, do subcellular fractionation to reduce the complexity to go and get these lower expressed proteins that we were after as well, and then go in in a pilot phase, measure proteins, and then target biases that you see against this expressed endpoint, and basically going through this iterative uh, circle to kind of complete this proteome, do some tests to convince you, and then once you have that, you could do a lot of interesting experiments. So it's briefly to show you, so we did from biological replicates from these two stages that I mentioned, induced, uninduced, induced again the stage where this type four uh, secretion system that straddles both the inner and outer membrane of those bacteria is expressed. We um, isolated 
are sequenced about 55 to 80 million reads per sample, including about 10 to 25 unique reads. As you can see soon, when you go, you get soon into this saturation fa phase I mentioned before. We extrapolated that even by sequencing double the amount of reads, we could not get much deeper into this express transcriptome. And then we also took some additional um, took some additional um, measurements to, uh, and criteria parameters to say we required five times five reads at the five prime end and a RPKM value of greater than ten to come up with an endpoint estimate of about 1,353 expressed genes under those conditions. And you see that nicely in the induced, of course, the target genes are several fold upregulated. So that gave us an endpoint um, against which now we could use, this is the endpoint given by the transcriptomics for both these conditions, against which we would go in in these matched samples and look at these uh, um, fractionations of the proteome at different conditions. Basically, we looked at the cytoplasm, total membrane, and further fractionated that into inner and outer membrane, all of that with high mass accuracy mass spectrometers. We went in with a pilot phase where we did eight experiments on the induced and uninduced, both conditions, cytoplasm, total membrane, and both inner and outer membrane. That gave us about 920 proteins. Again, we did some um, extrapolation here, some modeling. How would this be continuing if we would not change the experimental approach? But then we knew that, of course, here from this to this endpoint, there are, of course, other protein classes that we likely would target. And this is shown here, some density plots where you see for the green, the pilot phase, the distribution, for example, of the protein length. Then in orange, it's hard to see, is the protein distribution of all. And there's a bias for short proteins, which is typical of shotgun proteomics. We went in with directed experiments, in this case, gel filtration, where you enrich for short proteins and could overcome this and identify many new short proteins using this. We can do this for lower bundle proteins with a certain enrichment method called proteominer, which helped us to identify lower bundle proteins. Most importantly, you see here these last experiments here done with off gelective phoresis at the peptide level, which really helped us to massively increase the underexpressed basic proteins, typically of shotgun proteomics, and the membrane proteome, another very difficult part of the protein to get. This led us then to 1,250 proteins that we identified overall and we extrapolated. We could also show again there is almost no benefit when we add one quarter more uh, experimentation to this. Um, one of the things for the strategy that I mentioned that is important, we also use different search engines, one that is commonly used, MASCOT. Then there's a statistical combination with MASCOT percolator that helps you actually identify about 50% more correct peptide spectrum matches. And we use one publicly available software that, again, added another 60% of correct matches to those. And that's, of course, quite important. At the spectrum level, at the peptide level, you can see here the benefit of this MSGF plus software developed by Pavel Peftis group at uh, UC San Diego. At the peptide level, this also gives a much uh, large increase in terms of peptide identifications down to the protein level, then this becomes less pronounced, but importantly, with very stringent control of the false discovery rate, we came up to identify 1,250 proteins. Only seven of those were pointing against the decoy database, indicating that we had really, a, which you also need for doing this complete protein coverage, you need very, very stringent uh, false discovery control we went about tenfold or hundredfold more stringent than other people do this at the spectrum level, which uh, then translated to a very low protein false discovery rate, what we were aiming for. Just one thing to mention, these peptides, we also classified them according to the gene content, something we had described in correspondence Nature Biotech in 2010. This kind of gives you this, what I mentioned before, how information rich is a peptide. If we want to go to targeted proteomics, we really want to have those peptides that are information rich. If you're interested, you can follow this. Clearly, for eukaryotes, there's many classes, there's a lot of splice variants that can uh, make this picture much more complicated. For prokaryotes, it is not so difficult. But of course, when we think about moving into studying host pathogens with such a proteomics technique, you would definitely want to do this. We can visualize the data then onto the genome. That's the expressed genes. 
adding the 1250 proteins, which is about 90% of the expressed protein coding genes. And then you can start to see that there are certain areas where there is no proteins expressed. Here are the red ones. And when we add the genome information, we can see several things. Of course, our positive control, all the members are expressed, both transcript and protein. The TRW app, uh, operon, our negative control, not expressed at the protein, several of them at the transcript level. And then we see that there are certain genomic regions that are here annotated as profile G, genomic islands, where many of the ORFs are not expressed. And that's actually to be expected because often these genes on these genomic islands are required only under certain conditions. One thing to note also, among these 1,408 distinct proteins, there were about 50 that did not have any annotation in AGNOC, which is a very broad annotation. And these 50, we only found evidence for two of them. And that's a really very statistically significant uh, underrepresentation for these ORFs. And we believe that that's also evidence that some of these ORFs are actually over annotated. Comparing, when we look at the relative uh, computed protein abundance that we've seen, we compared this to three studies that have been published on Bartonella before and compared this to our proteome, the 1250. And you see that these, um, this is the relative protein abundance, that these previous studies really had identified mainly the highly abundant proteins, those that you can easily capture. We did, uh, we did manage to to go in and kind of come into the slow abundant protein range where we wanted to go. Just a couple of things now. On the pilot phase, I told you we had identified with these first eight experiments 924 proteins. When we look at the transmembrane proteins, um, there is a significant underrepresentation, as is typical often of shotgun proteomics. We went in and after all these experiments, we observed that actually there is no underrepresentation of membrane proteins anymore. We followed this up with many more uh, analyses. Some of them you can find in the supplement where we did 2D density plots based on the expression and some of the physical chemical parameters to really show this is what we could claim to be a complete expressed membrane proteome, likely for the first time. I'm showing you here now the genomic structure of the VRB uh, D4 uh, type 4 secretion uh, system with the downstream uh, effector proteins that are secreted into the eukaryotic host cell. Uh, you can see that at the RNA-seq level, these are largely induced. Many of them are largely induced, but the upregulation at the protein level is much more pronounced. You can visualize this here. And this is the first time that complete coverage of this, uh, of this um, type 4 secretion, of such a type 4 secretion has been achieved. Because typically, of course, the membrane proteins are very difficult to identify. And just to show you that the negative control, this type 4 secretion system relevant for the subsequent infection of erythrocytes is not regulated as we expected. So just this last one here, we can of course also do differential uh, expression analysis and basically rank the differentially expressed genes according to statistical significance using here DESEC or HR, for example, developed by Mark Robinson. And we realize is that in these conditions, what we really see is a massive reorganization of the membrane proteome with this key uh, target, of course, of the transcription uh, factor that we regulate, upregulate in the in vitro system. Autotransporters, hemin binding proteins, possibly a novel virulence factor, and actually an RNA pulse signal factor known to be involved in membrane control. So these were just to give you a bit of an overview of what we have done with this data set. Again, this is published and there's many more analyses that you might find interesting. What we did, of course, do having such a data set in hand is we tried to um, work on different aspects. And Ulrich Omasitz, who was also uh, responsible for the genome research paper, the first author, he developed this um, open software proper for the integrated uh, data visualization of both annotations coming, for example, from Uniprot, as well as experimental uh, proteomics information onto the predicted topology of these membrane proteins, which just gives you the chance, for example, to analyze. You can load the data and analyze and create these uh, publication-ready plots within half an hour, for example. We did that for the 280 Bartonella membrane proteins. So this is 
free to use and is heavily used by the community. There's another aspect I mentioned to you that the idea was to go towards targeted proteomics. As you may remember, in this discovery phase, we're measuring, for example, this uh, bacteria, any bacteria, and you will reach to a certain protein coverage. We went very high with this, with all this massive effort, but typically you may come with few experiments to 50% protein coverage. What you can do is to think, well, actually without doing more experiments, we want to now create a predictor that tells us what would be the best peptides if we wanted to do targeted proteomics for these 50% of the proteome that we did not identify. And we did this with a, a learning to rank uh, model developed by Emma Crayley, a postdoc uh, several years ago in the, in the group, who came up with this idea to rank the best peptides, the most often seen peptide and information rich peptide per protein to learn this and predict then the ranking for proteins that were not observed and to that way come to the fact that people could actually use such a software to predict for an organism where there's no proteomics data, which would be the peptides if we wanted to do this quantitative aspect of this proteomics. Uh, another study we undertook is we had the subcellular information and Daniel Steckhoven, a uh, postdoc in the lab, at the time, he went in and basically exploited this information he had from this cytoplasm, total membrane, inner membrane, outer membrane, and periplasm. It's important to note that at the time, we did not use harsh conditions to separate those proteins. So actually, many of the cytoplasmic proteins were still attached to their inner membrane proteins. And we could see this very nicely in, when we looked at the spectral counts and looked at do we find proteins exclusively found in the cytoplasm? There's very few. There's more in the total membrane fraction. But actually, when we then look at the ratio of the spectra that we observe in the total membrane over the cytoplasm, we could find then certain that are predominantly cytoplasmic. And we looked at marker proteins and find many of these marker proteins and find very high significant enrichment. And we can do this also for the predominant uh, total membrane, and that way kind of get an idea of where are these proteins preferentially located. And this is here to show you this very easy, on this noisy data, very easy spectral count proportion, which is high for the <coughs> spectral count proportion total membrane over cytoplasma. It's high for the membrane proteins, of course, and the cytoplasmic markers are located here. Interestingly, periplasmic markers even lower. This is the inner and outer membrane markers that are much higher. And actually, you can even use this, these ratios to paint onto the proteins how closely they are associated with the membrane. So another thing you may want to check out. And what Dan then went on to do is to basically look at principal component analysis and K-nearest neighbor classification to first do it on the markers, then add the predominantly located proteins, come up with a classification that was able to assign the predominant subcellularization on our data set for 94% of the proteins, including many for which P or B, one of the key uh, predictors, does not, have an, does not have a prediction. And he came up with an experimental outer membrane protein catalog. And these are, of course, of great importance if we think about the resurgence of infectious diseases. It's going to be more and more important for gram-negatives to be able to identify the entire outer membrane proteome and to look at these proteins, and that's what we described in that case. Now for the last part, I'm going to tell you about proteogenomics. Basically using this information, protein mass spectra, to identify information. And you've seen this picture before. We discussed this before. In this peptide spectrum matching process where you match the spectra against protein database, and then, of course, depending on what you add to this protein database, you will find it. Most extensive database would be a six-frame translation of the genome, very computational intense, and um, there are likely better ways. And we basically used our Bartonella data set and kind of started to look. We had relied on the NCBI reference genome annotation, and then this has been described before. That actually, if you look at other reference genome annotation, Genoscope, this is uh, the French uh, reference genome annotation, CMR from Craig Vendor, ChemGenome works with a different principle on thermodynamic prediction of what is a protein coding gene or not. You see that there's a lot of differences 
Many of these differences are based on the different start position of the protons, but not all, not all of them. So there are many ORFs that are only predicted by one. This is a common theme that you see that's not just for Bartonella. This is here what I showed you about the start codon uh, position difference. So let's look at the RefSeq. The RefSeq would call this position here as the start of the protein. Ensemble, Genoscope, and Cracker Enter say no, it starts here. Another 11 amino acids downstream. Chem Genome says no, it starts here. 27 amino acids more upstream. And this is common for many. And that's, of course, something that, in a way, it would be nice if you could capture this information and if you could use that information to search your proteomics data against. This is why we devised this. We would think of a novel generic proteogenomics approach now in a first phase, bringing together the different reference genome annotations, adding on top of these reference genome annotations, so here we're showing RefSeq Ensemble, the ones I've shown you before, and adding on top of those for those regions where there's no prediction, also in silico orbs. And we can basically, we can, within silico orbs, we can um, decide which length cutoff we want to take. We then create a minimally redundant protein database from these annotations, and we keep track of which of the annotations are identical and which ones are different. In an identifier, then we come with the experimental proteomics data, which is high quality proteomics data. We come with a very stringent based FDR filtering and we search this proteomics data against this database that we create. And what we're working on is to try to work on an expert-based system that helps us to basically process this data and prioritize this data in terms of, for example, show me what are the novel ORF candidates that you find based on the high-quality mass spectrometry data, what are the amino terminal annotation differences, you've seen the start sites that often differ, and for example, other questions could be, what about pseudogenes? We included those, and that also some of the large differences are pseudogenes, and we can basically look for that evidence. We can integrate this in IGV with the RNA-seq data that we have and these uh, predictions, and just showing you this, what we come up with. For Bartonella, with these 1488 RefC predicted genes, we found evidence in our data sets, which were two conditions, so we went quite deep, but it's only two conditions. Ideally, you would want to do this with 30 conditions, if you have, because then you really have a um, uh, much more chance to find those ORFs that are likely expressed under only specific conditions. But we found for all of these different reference genome annotations, including in silico, we found evidence for new ORFs. I'm just showing you one here, where the RNA-seq evidence here, uh, strand-specific RNA-seq, the red reads here, show that this short ORF is, in fact, expressed and then when we look at a plot where we plot the protein length of the proteins versus the spectral count as a measure of their, roughly a measure of their abundance, and I'm showing you two positive controls, the transcription factor we upregulate that drives the expression of all these green guys, that's the VIRB D4 system I showed you before, you kind of get an idea, okay, these are quite nicely expressed, and now look at all the red ones. These are selected new ORFs that we found with this method. And what you can see is, okay, first of all, well, there's even some that are 200 amino acids that were missed by RefSeq. They can be small, something like 26 amino acids. And based on their length, though, and expression, they're not, they're not so low expressed. So these may indeed have a function. Okay, so moving on here. As a function, and I'm just showing you now the integration of all this data onto the genome sequence, where this is the um, reference sequence from NCBI for Bartonella, the Houston 1 strain here, 1.931 base pairs. Looking at the forward strand, RNA-seq evidence that this is expressed here, and then we have several ORFs that we integrated in our database. There was an in silico ORF, there's no evidence for that. However, both for this CHEM genome and this microscope, so the French genoscope site predicted novel ORFs, we do find spectral evidence, and in this case it looks like the spectral evidence does point at that this is the relevant ORF that we can find here. So this is a generic thing that we can do, and I now want to basically uh, switch gears a bit and tell you about 
one way of doing it was to integrate these reference genome annotations. If you think about it in a more broad uh, way, the best way to do it actually is to sequence that genome. Because you know, somebody 10 years ago sequenced a strain or 15, who knows, deposited it in NCBI and it may have changed. So we went actually in to sequence Arginal Hensley, this two megabase pair genome. We thought, okay, cool. It's going to be with the technology with PacBio coming along at that time with 8,000 base pair reads, piece of cake, walk in the park, do it in a month. Teamed up with Mark Robinson and realized that, you no, know, it's not so easy. We actually then developed a server now in my group in Agroscope that allows you to visualize repeat sequences onto the genome. And this is when we realized, oof, Bartonella is not easy. You know, it's not a walk in the park. And this had been described by Sergey Koren, one of the key movers and shakers in this field, where he visualized the number of repeats of more than 500 base pairs that are about 90 or 95 percent identical, and then the maximum repeat length. And he classified easy genomes into this class one. So the, 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 there, the longest repeat is the RDNA operon. Uh, then there's these class two genomes that have many repeats, not longer than five, uh, six K, uh, KB about, but they have many repeats, so very difficult. So without PacBio, you cannot assemble them, not with MySeq. And then there's this class three, the difficult genomes where really you can have large repeats, and then the Bartonella here is clocked at something like 12 KB. And actually, when we did sequence the actual genome, it's larger. So that's why also one of the differences. But Clearly, now we're moving in this area where we can sequence those genomes rather straightforward. And so we developed this um, pipeline where we can do de novo genome assembly. We don't do reference-based. The HGAP turned out for us a good um, uh, assembly algorithm that has been described, so I'm not going to discuss it in detail. We do quality assessment of our assemblies, try to find the best genome draft by using even several metrics, then annotate this uh, with, for example, Proca, and then see what we get. So now, what we can do, we can use all this proteomics and RNA sec data that I showed you before, and we can search it against once the NCBI RefSec, what we thought was the gene we're dealing with, right? 1,931 uh, kilobase pairs. The actual assembly that we believe is the real sequence is about 23 kilobase uh, larger. So there are some inserts, uh, some uh, more uh, larger repeats. We have some measurement of the predicted, that's by proper protein coding ORs. And then we can match our spectra, this huge data set with very stringent control. And we see, okay, we can match about 10,000 spectra more to this assembly, about 400 peptide more, and about 13 proteins more. So we can use this to really then work on these de novo genomes. And one of the things we've also developed that we think is quite helpful is this, uh, if you have two closed genomes, you could think of basically globally aligning them, um, the assembly to the reference, and generate a virtual genome that has basically all the nucleotides from both genomes, and then map our experimental data, our annotations, our reads, proteins, peptides, all the experimental data to it to visualize this. This helps us to identify, for example, SNPs. And in this case, for example, you see here, this is the assembly. Because it's a SNP, of course, you have here the assembly, here in green, the reference. And you have in the, you would have uh, one additional nucleotide for each. You can see here, mapping back to the reference genome, there is no spectral counts. There's no peptide spectrum matches here. With the SNP, we find this is expressed, and we can detect this peptide with a SNP. We can do this um, also with insertions. So here, that's in the assembly. We have this insertion here that's within an, an open reading frame. And if you look at that, again, there's no spectrum of peptides matching when we use the reference sequence that doesn't have, doesn't know about this insertion. When we do have our assembly that we think is correct, we see this. And that, of course, has implications for using this in a clinical setting. Um, just showing you some more examples here. One frame shift within a filamentous hemagglutinin, that is uh, on the outer membrane, where we have an insertion in the, uh, or a deletion in our assembly. And 
there is no reads mapping in the reference sequence in our assembly, we get a read through and longer uh, reads mapping to it. Another example where in a likely operon, three open reading frames here in close vicinity, the latter two of which are nicely expressed under the settings we have with eight different peptides, 47 spectra, five peptides, 23 spectra. This here is not expressed. Potentially, this is the cause because there is an insertion into that open reading frame, although that's difficult to prove, but that could be one thing. And just a last example is to actually show another example where here on a very, that's gray A, transcription angle gaussian factor gray A, very highly expressed. Both on the wild type, we have this high expression, but then we have a SNP here in this position, and this is an older version it's where we did not use the virtual genome for this, but here it's supported by PEC biodata. This is a SNP, and when we look at the real genome, the our assembly, the entire protein sequence is, is covered by peptides because this is a highly, highly expressed protein. And clearly, now you can see, okay, we can sequence clinical genomes and we can use proteomics to potentially define and find single nucleotide polymorphisms at the protein level. So we have worked with different collaborators, with Leobo and um, Aurélien Carrier. <coughs> We've applied this proteogenomics approach here on local data Turkey and obligate symbiont, where we could show that there are some ores that were missed in the annotation that are important for uh, secondary metabolite. They're actually highly expressed. And with radial sodium, meponicum, that's just basically in revision, we were able to integrate uh, transcription start site data. 5 prime end transcription start sites. Sorry, go back here. And for example, here's shown one of the bradyl sodium meponicum genes. This is a large genome, nine megabases. And there's two different transcription start sites, one internal one. And we find unique peptide evidence for both of them. And basically showing that there's also protein isoforms starting within a predicted open reading frame. We did find a large number of ores actually compared to another study that had used this data without the, without the um, internal transcription start sites. <coughs> and we actually add quite a lot more, both in terms of new open reading frames and new amino termini. So this is a generic approach. And so far, in most of the prokaryotes that we looked, we can find evidence for these missed ores. So coming to the end and summarizing this, so I've told you about that in the proteomics field, there has been this move to also like in genomics go from a discovery phase where you basically catalog what is there to a targeted proteomics phase where you can create quantitative data series with much higher sensitivity and complete series. We developed a generic strategy to reach complete condition-specific expressed proteomes in prokaryotes, where this strategy is feasible with a manageable um, effort. We basically looked at, because we had this available, the subcellular localization, which often provides some interesting insights and could lead to functional predictions of ORS without any functional annotation. Clearly, we did not find expression evidence for all the proteins. So we could, if we wanted now to go in and, for example, as I mentioned, we, if, uh, we found a complete membrane proteome. If we now want to go in with targeted proteomics and look at the surfaceome, the entire surfaceome, in a many, many different conditions, we could use our software here, predict the best peptides for this targeted proteomics. Clearly, what's important is to realize that the genomes, even today, still are our annotation draft, and that this proteomics data can largely help in correcting this. I should mention here also the NCBI annotation that we had relied on, this 1488 ORFs, it actually changed a couple of months ago. They deleted 104 ORFs and added another 140. When we go in with our data, we can show that actually this is a new pipeline they're using, GenMark3. We can show that for 14 of the ORFs that they removed, we still have, we have expression evidence. So it's likely that they're expressed. 
and that for some of them that they added new that we find evidence. So I'm just saying this is really a, a moving field and doing it de novo with your sequence, with your strain in your lab is going to give you the best possible setting to really go. And clearly this has implications for clinical proteomics. Then the most importantly, many people involved that did all this work, I want to point out Ulrich Onositz was the key mastermind behind the uh, genome research study, subcellular localization, uh, Dan Steckhofen, statistician from the ETH who helped us a lot with bringing statistical excellence to, to these analyses. We're grateful to Christoph Deo and his student Maxime for sending us the protein extracts and RNA-Sec, the total RNA-Sec data. Uh, Mark, who is a collaborator that we're working on on the PacBio uh, genome assembly. Olga, who did the first analysis on the, or the first assembly efforts. And again, here we went through several rounds, actually, and only lately did we get with the latest long reads, we got uh, uh, success. Functional Genomics Center, they had prepared the protein extracts based on the, or the protein uh, fractionation based on the extracts and measured the proteomics. And there, Patagnani had with the PacBio, a flop for access and support. And then the group at Acroscope, where Uli announced a postdoc, I did his PhD uh, student with us for three years, Michael Schmidt, uh, a civil service worker and a former diploma student. And clearly, we're very grateful for the great collaboration also with Berndt at ETH. Now moving into a collaboration with Beat to actually look on orthogonal data on mutagenesis, where he shows he finds genome regions that are essential, where there's no of predicted, whether we find the evidence for those, which would basically bring this to another level and show, okay, it's not only new ORFs, there are some essential ORFs that we did not predict. And then there's other people that we collaborate with and hear the funding agencies. And then I thank you a lot for the attention and hope that that was halfway, could be followed what I was telling you about it and glad to take any questions you may have. Thanks.